Hello and welcome to another one of Mr. Deep in Science lessons. For today's session you're going to need a book, a pen, some graph paper and a worksheet which you can download in the link below. In your books I'd like to get down today's title which is The Rate of Photosynthesis and for our starter activity I'd like us to look at some of the plants that have red leaves. How are these plants adapted for photosynthesis? I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time pause the video and when you're finished we'll go through the answers together. Are we finished? Let's have a look at some of the adaptations of this tree. The leaves will have a large surface area so that they can absorb a large amount of sunlight. The leaves are going to be thin so that they can exchange gases more effectively. On the bottom of the leaves they are likely to have stomata so that gas can be exchanged and water can escape through the bottom of the leaf. But with respect to this tree there is one thing that we shouldn't say. And we shouldn't say that these leaves have a lot of chloroplasts. Because remember, our chloroplasts contain chlorophyll, and that green pigment is what makes our leaves appear green. This tree is likely to have less chloroplasts than other trees because its leaves are not green. Today, we are going to be looking at some of the other factors outside of leaf adaptations which can affect the rate of photosynthesis. We are going to look at four factors which can affect photosynthesis. We're going to plot and interpret some graphs for three of the limiting factors light intensity, concentration of carbon dioxide, and temperature. And we're also going to touch on how plants transport water. So if we recall our word equation for photosynthesis, carbon dioxide plus water gives us glucose and oxygen. Then there are some factors which affect the rate of photosynthesis, which we can determine from this alone. And if you have done the rates of reaction topic in chemistry, you will know that the concentration of the reactants can affect the rate of reaction. Our reactants are everything on the left hand side of the arrow, so our carbon dioxide and water. That means if we increase the concentration of carbon dioxide, then we can get a faster rate of reaction for photosynthesis. If we increase the availability of that water, then we can increase the rate of photosynthesis. Last time we said that this was an endothermic reaction, so it needs to absorb energy from the sunlight. And so, if you have more sunlight, you can increase the rate of photosynthesis. If you think back to the red tree in our starter, it is likely that tree will have a lower rate of photosynthesis because it has a lower number of chloroplasts. If you increase the number of chloroplasts, then you increase the rate of photosynthesis. We also said last time that this reaction was governed by enzymes, which means that temperature is also going to affect the rate of photosynthesis. We're going to have an optimum temperature. So if it gets too cold, then the rate of photosynthesis will slow down. And if it gets too hot, then the rate of photosynthesis will also slow down. And with that in mind, we're going to have a look at the first task on our worksheet. We have got four plants and in each picture, there is something which is limiting its rate of photosynthesis. So out of the factors we have just been talking about, one of those is preventing these plants from photosynthesizing as effectively as they could. I want you to identify what factor it is which is limiting the rate of photosynthesis and I want you to explain how you decided on your answer. And if you really want a challenge, I'd also like to know why the trees in the Amazon rainforest grow higher than trees in England. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you identified your factors? Let's look at plant A. The limiting factor for plant A is the concentration of carbon dioxide. Plants usually get their carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but this is difficult if your plant is underwater. And because there is less carbon dioxide, it decreases the rate of photosynthesis. Looking at plant B, its limiting factor is the amount of light. Photosynthesis is an endothermic reaction, and without light, there will be no reaction. Plant C, you might recognize from our starter activity, and it has a lack of chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are the site of photosynthesis, and we know that this plant is lacking in chloroplasts because the leaves aren't green. So what's preventing plant D from photosynthesizing? Well, next to that plant, we've got a bit of snow. That implies that it's a bit cold. 
So temperature would be the factor which is affecting our rate of photosynthesis. Remember, photosynthesis is governed by enzymes. So if it gets too cold, the enzyme activity will decrease and the rate of reaction will decrease. So why is it that trees in the Amazon rainforest grow higher than trees in England? The Amazon rainforest has a temperature which is better suited for the enzymes in plants. They get a lot more sunlight and the more sunlight we have, the more photosynthesis can occur. And there is also an abundance of water for all of the plants to grow. So now we can recall some factors which affect photosynthesis. Our next task is best completed on a piece of graph paper and I would like you to plot a line graph on how the concentration of carbon dioxide affects the rate of photosynthesis. And remember to label those axes and have a sensible scale. And if you finish your graph and you still want a challenge, then try and explain why there is no further increase in photosynthesis after the carbon dioxide concentration gets above 0.1. And you can also try to suggest what would be the rate of photosynthesis for most plants outside and try and explain that answer. You may need to think back to what concentration of carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you got your plot? Let's have a look at this. For my graph, I've started at zero for my rate of photosynthesis and I've gone up in twos from zero to 12. And for my concentration of carbon dioxide, I've gone up in 0.04%, all the way up to 0.16%. So I'm gonna plot my points. My first one being at 0.02 goes there with a rate of photosynthesis of three. 0 0.04 has a rate of photosynthesis of six. My 0 0.06 has a rate of photosynthesis of nine. My CO2 concentration of 0.08 has a rate of photosynthesis of 11. And then my rate of photosynthesis for 0 0.10, 0 0.12 and 0 0.14 are 12. But this is a line graph, so we need to draw a line through our points and it needs to be a nice smooth curve. And you can see on my graph, I have forced my line to go through zero. This is because it makes sense that if there is no carbon dioxide, the rate of photosynthesis will be zero. And notice how I have not just connected the dots, I've tried to keep my line nice and smooth. So let's have a look at those challenge questions then. The reason why the rate of photosynthesis doesn't increase past this point is because the concentration of carbon dioxide is no longer a limiting factor. This means that there is something else which is stopping it from photosynthesizing quicker. It could be there is not enough light energy for the plant to absorb. It could be that there is not enough water available. It could be that the temperature is not at the optimum. And it could also be the number of chloroplasts. But at this point where the graph begins to plateau, the concentration of carbon dioxide is not the factor which is preventing it from doing any more photosynthesis. Suggesting then the rate of photosynthesis for most of the plants outside is going to be this six. But why is it this? It is because the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 0.04%. And at this 0.04% on our graph, the rate of photosynthesis is six arbitrary units. So now we're gonna move down our worksheet and look at some of the other questions. If you haven't got a worksheet, don't worry. Our questions are right here on screen. I want you to look at these two graphs and answer the three questions about each one. So I want you to describe the shape of each graph. Each graph has a point which is marked either with X or Y, and I want you to explain what is happening at that point. And for this graph, I would like you to explain what the value for the rate of photosynthesis would be if light intensity was zero. And for the graph on the right, I would like you to explain why the rate of photosynthesis is zero when it's above 50 degrees C. I'm gonna put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. So let's have a look at this first graph. Now, when we are describing the shape of this graph, we need to break it up into two sections because there's two things going on here. Number one, as the light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis also increases until you get to this point because the rate of photosynthesis plateaus. So it stops increasing. And the reason for that is the answer to our second question. 
At x, the light intensity is no longer a limiting factor. However, this does not mean that the rate of photosynthesis is at its maximum. If we increase the amount of carbon dioxide, it could go up. If we increase the temperature, it could go up. So avoid saying it is at maximum. Do say that the light intensity is no longer affecting the rate. It is no longer a limiting factor. Explain what would be the value for the rate of photosynthesis if the light intensity was zero. Well, if there was no light, then there would not be enough energy for our photosynthesis reaction. Remember, it is an endothermic reaction. It needs to absorb energy from its surroundings. Looking at the second graph then, when we describe the shape of it, we again need to split it into two sections. Number one, as the temperature increases, the rate of photosynthesis also increases. Then the rate of photosynthesis begins to plateau, but then it drops to zero just before 50 degrees. At point Y then, when the rate of photosynthesis is at its highest, we need to say that temperature is no longer a limiting factor. Remember, it is not at its maximum. If it stayed at this temperature and we increase the carbon dioxide concentration, the rate of reaction could increase. If we increase the availability of water, the rate of reaction could increase. If we increase the light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis could increase. We do not know from this graph alone that the rate of photosynthesis is at its maximum. We do know that temperature is no longer a limiting factor. It is not the temperature which is preventing it from photosynthesizing any quicker. So why does the rate of photosynthesis drop to zero at about 50 degrees C. Remember, this reaction is governed by enzymes, and if they get too hot, their active site will denature. This means that the photosynthesis will not occur. If the enzymes are not available to carry out the photosynthesis reaction, photosynthesis doesn't occur. So now we have plotted and we've interpreted some graphs for three of the limiting factors, light intensity, the concentration of carbon dioxide, and temperature. So now I want to talk a little bit about how that water gets from the root to the leaf in order to carry out this photosynthesis. And this transportation occurs in the stem through these vessels called the xylem. And there's some things that we need to know about xylem. Xylem are made of dead cells. Xylem have open spaces between these cells to allow the water to flow. The xylem's main function is to transport water and it only transports this water in one direction, from the bottom of the plant to the top of the plant. And with that in mind, what I'd like to do is to sketch this diagram of the xylem and describe its structure and function. And you may or may not have seen that young trees often have these protective collars put around them. I want you to explain how this helps them to grow. And you need to explain why. So you need to say what the protective collar is actually protecting them against and what would happen if it wasn't there. And if you can explain it in terms of the xylem, that would be even better. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have we got our xylem sketch? Let's talk about the four things that we should have put down about it. It's made of dead cells. It has open spaces between those cells. Its primary function is to transport water and it only does it in one direction. Looking at this challenge then, why these trees often have protective collars around them. It prevents animals and strong winds from breaking the xylem. If the plant is unable to transport water to the leaves, then they would not be able to photosynthesize, which would result in the death of the plant. Our next task is a bit of a recap from our first photosynthesis lesson. And I want to know what the equation is for photosynthesis. And I want to know how does the water and the carbon dioxide get into the leaf for photosynthesis. And if you really want to challenge, I'd like to know what is shown in the picture and what do you think is the function of these structures? So you're going to need to be thinking about those leaf adaptations. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you recorded your equation? 
Photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus water gives us oxygen and glucose. So how does that water and carbon dioxide get into the leaf for photosynthesis? That carbon dioxide is present in the atmosphere and it enters the leaf through the stomata, the holes in the bottom of the leaf. The water is absorbed by the roots and then it is transported up the stem through the xylem into the leaf. Our picture was actually the underside of a leaf and it shows the stomata, the stomata which are there to let carbon dioxide into the leaf and to let oxygen and water out of the leaf. But let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. This is called the transpiration stream. And transpiration is simply the movement of water through the plant, up the root, up the stem, into the leaf, and then out of the leaf again. So the water will start in the soil. It is absorbed by the roots. It is transported up the stem through the xylem, and then the water will enter the leaf for photosynthesis. But some of that water is going to evaporate and that water vapor is going to escape from the leaf through the stomata. And with that in mind, I would like you to describe the process of transpiration. If it helps to draw the diagram, you can do. And I'd like you to really try and expand your answer. By what process is the water absorbed by the roots? And why does water only flow in one direction? And if you really want to challenge, you can think about how plants can prevent this water loss. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you described this process of transpiration? Remember, our water starts in the soil. The water is then absorbed by the roots by the process of osmosis where water moves from a high water potential to a low water potential. This water is then transported up the stem through the xylem. It only moves in one direction because it's replacing the water which has been lost by evaporation and the water that has been used in photosynthesis. That water will then enter the leaves for photosynthesis and then some of that water will evaporate from the leaf and exit through the stomata. And if plants need to conserve water, then they can close the stomata to stop the water vapor from escaping. Plants can also wilt, which will lower the amount of surface area they have available for catching sunlight, which will decrease the amount of photosynthesis and the volume of water which they are using for that reaction. So now we can explain how plants transport water through the xylem, which means there's only one more thing to do. And our plenary today is to suggest where on the planet you would expect to find the smallest plants. And I would like you to explain your answer in terms of limiting factors of photosynthesis. If you've got any really good answers, you can put them in the comments below. But that covers everything for today's photosynthesis lesson. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the lesson. If you found it useful, don't forget to press the like button. And why don't you subscribe and press the bell icon as well so you know when the next lesson's available. You can also support me on Patreon and you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And I appreciate all the support. And I'll see you next time.